welcome back to the workshop. In today's video, I'm gonna be making one of my favorite things to make, and that is a coffee table. Now, why do I like making coffee tables so much? I think that's because I consider myself as a designer just as much as a maker. And I love designing things, and I feel like with a coffee table, I can really focus on the design, and that's all I really need to worry about. For example, with a chair, it's not just the looks, it's got to be comfortable, it's got to be ergonomic, and it's got to take a lot of weight. However, with a coffee table, the most amount of weight it really needs to take is, you know, glasses and books. However, with this coffee table, I made it so well, it can probably take the weight of a car. Generally, with coffee tables, it takes a lot less weight. So if someone were to ask me what's my favourite thing to make, uh, I do always say coffee tables. This coffee table in particular is quite a large one. It's a circular coffee table with a diameter of 120 centimetres and it's quite low actually. The height of the table is 35 centimetres, which will work quite well with the low seats that will go around it. This project was made from some beautiful English elm from Latham Timbers. I haven't actually used a lot of elm in my career, but this wood is magnificent. I love the grain. I love how it's got sort of pippy, burly areas, as well as curly grain and green flexing. It's got a wide range of colors, and uh, the grain is just so unique to elm. You don't see that in many other woods. The unique grain definitely stands out and makes a table very unique. The table base is made from elm, and the table top is one inch thick, birch plywood with an elm lipping and elm constructional veneer on either side. Now I think there is a misconception uh, with veneer in furniture making. When people hear veneer they sometimes get scared but to be honest there is no reason to be. There are two types of veneer. You do get very bad veneers and you do find that in uh, mass-produced furniture where they use very thin veneers that are very fragile and uh, wear over time and peel up. However, if you're making fine woodworking pieces, uh, quite often furniture makers will use constructional veneer, which can be 10 times the thickness of veneers you'll find on mass-produced furniture. I often talk about veneers and the importance of them in uh, demonstrations I do around the country, and I always get a lot of questions uh, about people thinking using veneers is uh, a cheaper way of making furniture or you're cutting corners, but actually it is the complete opposite. In fact, with this project, it increased the material costs, it increased uh, the time it took to make, and it increased the skill level. So it's actually a lot harder to do veneer tabletops than it would be a solid wood top. And I'm not saying all tabletops should be veneered, but there's definitely certain projects where it's a good idea to use it and others where a solid wood top would be preferred. If you're new to woodworking and you didn't know, pretty much all top woodworkers that charge hundreds of thousands of pounds for their pieces all use veneer in their work. So it definitely isn't a sign of bad quality. In my opinion, it's a sign of good quality in a lot of cases. So for this table, the tabletop is so large, I didn't want any chance of it warping, cupping, twisting when it gets to the client's house and I wanted it to remain flat forever. So if I were to make this tabletop from the solid wood, it is quite likely over time for cracks to appear or in the worst case scenario, the tabletop to warp and cup, uh, which is obviously disastrous. So I decided to veneer it, which actually means the material costs go up in mass production furniture, one area they can cut corners and reduce costs is putting a cheap core material in between the veneers, like a hardboard or even cardboard in many IKEA tabletops. But for the core of my tabletop, I used one inch thick Baltic birch plywood, which is around 300 pounds for a sheet. So it definitely isn't cheap stuff, but it's gonna give me the strongest, the flattest and the best core possible for my tabletop. Then I veneered either side of the plywood with constructional elm veneer. Not only is veneer furniture good for preventing uh, warping and twisting and cupping, it also gives you the opportunity to pick some very decorative veneers. So for this veneer, I actually picked the elm board myself, which later then was cut up into thin sheets of veneer. This way I could pick the board with the most amount of grain character in it, so I could make sure my tabletop was gonna look beautiful. 
I got the veneers cut to 1.5 millimeters thick, which is definitely thick enough to handle any abuse chucked at the table and just general wear and tear over many years to come. Normally when you're veneering a panel, it's a, a rectangular tabletop. So lipping the edge is very easy. You can just rip thin strips of wood, glue that on the edge and then veneer either side of the panel. But because this was a circular tabletop, I couldn't just glue on a straight bit of lipping. So I actually tried out a new process, which was very fun. So I machined up some Elm and put it in the CNC. I created some G-code on VCarve Pro and I cut out some perfect fitting segments. I was really impressed with the CNC because I cut out a circle of plywood with a router on a circle cutting jig and these segments wrapped around that circle perfectly with no gaps. I glued these segments around the plywood and then I could veneer either side. I created the segments quite thick because I wanted it to be nice and strong if the table were to get hit, as well as giving me enough material to route a large chamfer on the bottom at the end. I have to say this new workshop extension I got has been a big help. I'm able to make these larger pieces uh, a lot quicker now in this space. In fact, this large assembly table was so helpful and I used it for the majority of the build. If you're interested, it's called the Bora Centipede. You would have seen it's sort of like an accordion. It can expand out and collapse to a very small size if you ever need more floor space. And I just put a sheet of MDF on as my worktop and it's also great for cutting sheet materials on as well. One area of woodworking that is overlooked by a lot of woodworkers is the sanding. You can make the nicest looking joints in the world and have a really cool design for your piece of furniture, but if you don't sand the piece correctly and nicely, it can completely ruin the piece because furniture is very tactile and your client will want to touch it. And if it's rough, then it's gonna completely ruin the end piece of work. So I normally spend a long time sanding my pieces, getting in all the areas, sanding the underneath of a tabletop just as much as the top. Because the first thing people are gonna do when they see your table is touch it. And if it's not smooth, then it's gonna give a bad impression. One great tip of getting really smooth surfaces is denibbing in between your sanding grits. And all that is, is spraying the surface of wood with a mist of water, and that raises the grain and swells the fibers, which you can then later sand off with the next higher grit of sandpaper. And I tried to do this in between every grit of sandpaper. I start off at around 120 grit and then end at 180 or 240. It also does depend on what finish you're using. With Ruby Eye Monaco, the highest I've seen people recommend going is 180. Another benefit of denibbing while you're sanding is it will prevent the grain from raising when you later finish the piece. If you don't do that, you may have found when you're oiling a piece the grain can then raise, and then that can leave a really rough surface, which will then need to denib after, which can make the finishing process longer, and in the worst case scenario, it can ruin your finish with the sanding scratch marks from smoothing the surface again. So I found if I denib a lot during the sanding process, when I add the Rubio Monaco, that doesn't raise the grain at all, and I'll have a really smooth surface at the end of it. And that's extra important with Rubio Monocoat because that's obviously a one layer finish. So if you didn't denib and you've raised the grain with that finish, then you're in a bit of trouble and you've got to start over again. When I started woodworking, I always added a lot of glue in my pieces and I always ran into problems later on cleaning up that glue once it had dried. As I made more and more pieces, I realized the importance of adding the right amount of glue in the joint or other woodworking processes like bent lamination and veneering. It isn't something that is actually taught a lot in furniture making schools or design technology uh, lessons at school. And it's maybe a topic I can do a video on in the future. But if you're starting out woodworking, it is quite difficult knowing how much glue you need to add. But you've got to remember, glue is stronger than the wood itself. So for many woodworking joints, you only need small dabs of glue. And in some situations you want glue squeeze out and in others you don't. If you're building a box, for example, that hasn't got an internal lining that would hide any glue squeeze out, then you want to add very small dabs of glue. However, if you're gluing up a panel for a tabletop, 
that would then later be sanded and planed flush. You could add more glue and you would want to see the glue squeeze out there because later on you will be removing that glue and you'll be sanding the board flush. For this project in particular, the base was made up from two segmented rings and then around 60 dowels spacing the two rings apart. Gluing up the rings, I added a lot of glue because later on I would be flush trimming the outside and sanding it flush. However, when I was gluing the dowels in place, it'd be very difficult cleaning up that glue squeeze out in those tiny gaps. So I made sure to add very small amounts of glue in those mortises when I was gluing the base together. And I wasn't worried about the base not being strong enough because in each ring there were 60 mortises. So there is so much glue surface with all those mortises added together and uh, contact area. The base is going to be so strong when both halves are glued together. Totally depends on the woodworking process to determine how much glue you should use. For example, with veneering, you want a very thin film of glue on your substrate. And you want an even thinner film of glue if you're using standard 0.6 millimeter thick veneer, because as you're pressing it in the vacuum bag, the glue can actually seep through the pores of the wood and come to the surface, and then you can get some shiny spots in the end result. It's a bit easier to veneer constructional veneer because it's a thicker piece of wood, it's harder for the glue to seep through that. And when you're bent laminating wood, you normally want to put quite a lot of glue on that to really lock the layers in place. And most of the time, you're doing a lot of clean up and shaping and sanding of a bent lamination. So any glue squeeze out will get removed in the final result. All my pieces are designed and handmade by me, but I do really like how I incorporate my CNC into my work, especially when I'm making jigs and templates. For this project, I made a jig and template for the leg base. I cut out a perfect circle on the CNC with evenly spaced holes all the way around. This template allowed me to flush trim the segmented rings into perfect circles. I used the drill press to help me drill out those mortise holes for the dowels and the holes in the template helped me evenly space out those mortises and made sure that both rings match perfectly. So the leg base has around 60 dowels connecting the two segmented rings together. Normally these dowels would be turned on the lathe, however that's very difficult to get them all to match perfectly. It's very easy for one to be slightly too wide or slightly too thin. Even if it's half of a millimetre, it would be very noticeable in the end result when they're all lined up together. If one dowel was different, it would stand out like a sore thumb. So I decided to machine up the dowels in a different way. I cut the blanks out on a bandsaw and the table saw and planed them perfectly square. I made sure the blanks were oversized, which helped me with processes later on. I used a roundover bit on the router table, which carved out a perfect quarter circle. I rotated the blank four times, passed it through the router bit, and that gave me a dowel shape. You can see it's very important to keep the blank oversized when you're using the router table. If I ran the whole blank over the router bit, I would lose those square ends and I'd have no square edge to push up against the fence. And then it would be quite a dangerous cut as the blank could start spinning. At this stage, the dowels were still rough. So I mounted each dowel individually onto the lathe and sanded it that way. It was much quicker doing it this way as the lathe was spinning and I just needed to hold up some sandpaper and it would sand it smooth. I put the sandpaper onto a sanding block to make sure that my sanding pattern was flat and I was applying even pressure across the dowel and I wasn't gonna get any divots. If I hand sanded each dowel individually off the lathe, it would have took a lot longer. Now the grain of the dowels are running lengthways across the lathe, so my sanding pattern is actually going across the grain. And once the dowel was smooth, I stopped the lathe and did the final sanding by hand going with the grain to remove all those sanding marks that were going across the grain. In this build, there was quite a lot of repetitive tasks shaping 60 dowels, drilling two mortises on either side of them and sanding them all smooth, as well as cutting many segments for the segmented rings. One thing I've noticed is 
I quite like repetitive tasks in woodworking. I think I have a lot of patience for it. I love carvings, I love doing inlays. They tend to take quite a long time. I like getting into a zone and just working for many hours. My first woodwork teacher, I remember saying to me that he just wouldn't have the patience to do what I was doing. A lot of my builds, sometimes I'm on a particular process for many days. For my mosaics, I've got to cut out thousands of tiles and I'm sitting there for days creating this pattern. And I really enjoy doing something like that. And I think what keeps me going is just picturing the end result. I always have a vision in my head of what the end result would look like. And that's what keeps me going. And I almost want to stay there until it's done because I'm so excited to see the end result. And I'm not sure if that's something unique to me that I like, you know, working on repetitive tasks and I've got the patience for it or many woodworkers do that. Let me know in the comments down below. But talking to other woodworkers, they've told me they don't like the sound of cutting thousands of segments for a vase or a mosaic. Uh, so maybe, maybe it's just me. But yeah, this project was a lot of fun to make. Normally when I'm making segmented rings, it's for a vase. But for this piece, I made a segmented ring for the lipping for the tabletop and in the leg base. The leg base could be made in a few different ways. It could be cut in two halves from solid wood. It could be steam bent. It could be bent laminated. But I quite like the segmented look. I think it's very impressive seeing all these bricks come together to make this perfect circle. And I like how when light hits the ring, the grain on the different segments show up in a different color. So it's very obvious. You can see each brick uh, because the grain is pointing in a different direction. To attach the base onto the top, I made four wooden brackets. Even though these would never be seen, I still wanted to make these look nice, so I added a decorative curve and chamfered the edges. I cut a mortise into the leg base. I removed most of the waste with a trim router and then cleaned up the edge with a chisel. These brackets will help locate the leg base in the center of the table with some bolts and inserts. I used threaded inserts because it's a much higher quality way of securing two components together. If I just used a screw, Every time you take the screw in and out of a piece of wood, it wears down that hole as the screw thread grinds on the wood fibers and will make that hole bigger. And over time, that screw will have no biting power into the piece of wood. Whereas with a metal insert, it doesn't wear and you'll be able to take this bolt in and out how many ever times you want. So if my client wants to move this table ever in the future or move it to another room or move its location, removing the base will be just as easy as installing it. I used Ruby and Monocoat for this project. I put a white pad on my orbital sander, which helped me apply the finish onto the tabletop and really helped me work it into the grain. It's a much faster process than doing it by hand. And in my opinion, you get a better result as well. However, with the leg base, with the dowels, I couldn't use the orbital sander and I had to apply that by hand, which took a lot longer. It took about two hours to apply the Rubio on all the dowels but I got an even coating on everything and I was really liking how the grain was popping. I use Rubio Monocoat Pure, which is my favorite and it just really emphasizes the grain on most timbers and gives a really nice sort of satin sheen. What I like about Rubio is you can still see the natural beauty in the wood. Some finishes are so thick and sort of plasticky, it kind of takes away from the wood and in some cases it just looks like 
a plastic piece of furniture or the grain's just been printed onto the surface. But with Rubio, you still can feel the texture of the wood. You've got all the protection you need and it gives you a nice shine as well without making the piece look like plastic. So that is a coffee table complete. I'm absolutely thrilled with this piece. I love the wood. It's a simple design, but there's so much going on in the making. All that's left to do now is to take some final pictures and then I'll be delivering it to my clients. Mm -hmm.